Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Texoma Cattlemen here on 95.7 FM, 1420 AM, The Warrior, sponsored by Fan and Ag Products. We appreciate you tuning in to our show today. Hope you're enjoying your week so far and, and looking forward to the weekend. I think there is good news around the corner for next week. I think we're, we've got an order in for some, some cooler weather, so that's some good news for next week, but uh, until then, we'll bear with these these hot temperatures. Uh, we'd like to remind everybody, we've been been uh, announcing it every week on the Texoma Cattlemen for the last few weeks, but we are in the time right now in which we are collecting our hay show samples for our hay show, and uh, the hay show will actually take place on September the 20th, but right now, up until August the 28th, we're collecting our hay show samples, so if you have any samples that we, you would like to bring to us, uh, to get tested, just give us a call at 903-583-7453. If you have any specific questions, you can send me an email. Uh, but, it, but if you've got those samples collected, just simply bring them to our office at 2505 North Center Street in Bonham, and we will get those uh, uh, subsample for you and then get them sent off for testing and get those results back for you. If you have any questions on it, again, let us know. We'll be happy to to answer those for you. Um, on our program this week, uh, we're going to talk here in a little bit about winter pastures. Uh, you, you might think I'm, I'm crazy for bringing that up right now, being that it's uh, near 100 degrees outside. But uh, we are in the time now whenever we're beginning to think about preparing for putting in those winter pastures. We're going to talk about that here just momentarily. And those of you that are familiar with our Egg 30 show that comes on live right after this, Blake Bennett's not able to be with us with the market report this week, so we're going to carry on talking about winter pastures in that program. So since we have plenty of time before we do, I do want to let you know about an insect pest that has come across the county over the last week. Uh, it's one that we haven't seen uh, for, for, um, in, a, in a large portion, I guess you could say, over about the last couple of years, but it's, it's reared its ugly head again this year, but it's the pest known as a sugarcane aphid. Uh, those of you that have soil and seed in varieties of uh, hay grazer, for instance, uh, if you have some Johnson grass, uh, if you were around our county of, or North Texas area in particular, I guess you could say, over about the last uh, three years ago, you probably know what this, this pest is. It, it, uh, it came about in about 2013 in this county, and they hadn't seen it prior to that. Uh, for about 30 years and so 2013 was the first year we've seen it in quite some time but um it is a pest that that does like the weather that we're dealing with right now it likes this uh, warm humid environment and uh, that's why we've seen it pop up so what it, what it is is it's a, a kind of a yellowish colored aphid uh and and you'll notice it again on on our sorghum sudan varieties and johnson grass but if you notice a shiny glossy appearance on the top side of that leaf uh, some say it looks like the leaf sugar coated some say it looks like honeydew on the leaf uh, some say it looks like a, a, sh a shiny wax paper of some sort uh, but if you notice that appearance on the top side of that leaf if you go over to it and you want to see what a sugar cane aphid is just take that leaf and flip it up and i guarantee you there will be aphids on the underside of that leaf so what does it do? Well, it's uh, sucking the sap out of that, that plant. It works just as an aphid does, and we're, we're familiar with aphids, with, with our landscape trees, our, our, our ornamental trees. Uh, so, so we've seen aphids. We're familiar with them around North Texas, around, around Fannin County. So it works just, just the same way. It's going to be on the underside of that plant, and it's going to be, be uh, sucking the moisture, the nutrients, the sap out of that plant. And what the residue is, it's left over is actually honeydew, honeydew on the top side of that plant, and, uh, that leaf, and so that's the, the residue that people are seeing. You may be driving down the road, and you may, may see Johnson grass just kind of shining. Well, that's what it is. It's honey, honeydew on that plant. So, what do you do? Well, if you notice it and you're close to a hay harvest, probably the best thing to do is to go in there and get a hay harvest on that uh, pretty quick, as quick as you can. Um, if you don't, what's going to happen when we draw that, that, 
that sap out of that plant and the moisture, the nutrients, well, what, what ends up happening is that that plant's going to turn brown on us. That leaf's going to turn, turn brown. And so we want to try to get to it before it gets to that state. Now, there is uh, uh, insecticide opportunities for you if you wish to, to, to uh, apply an insecticide. If you do have it, if you're quite some time from getting a hay harvest, uh, there's an emergency label for an insecticide called Transform that's out there. Uh, it's a, it's a, an emergency label that they have been getting for the sugarcane aphid over the last uh, few years. And so that is available again this year for you. If, if you have any questions on, on uh, that particular insecticide, just let me know. But that is uh, the insecticide that's uh, available to you. If you have questions on sugarcane aphid, again, we're, we're here to help. And keep your guard out for the army worms. We'll put that uh, little, little reminder out there this week. Uh, uh, we've had a few reports of them around the county, but not the, uh, the mass reports you could say that we've seen over the last few years uh, whenever whenever they come and they they basically flood our county um, but uh, keep a keep a watch out and keep scouting those pastures and hay meadows we're going to move into talking about winter pastures today and again as i mentioned at the first part of the program uh, you, you may think i'm crazy talking about this with uh, with the 100 degree temps that we've got outside but uh You'll find out here a little bit whenever we talk about the planting window that you have on uh, cool season pastures or, or hay meadows or food plots for that matter for our, our wildlife uh, that, that our window is coming close to when we can start planting those. September 15th is kind of our start date of planting here in the county. But whenever we think about winter pastures, we think about dividing them into a couple of different categories. We have our cool season legumes and we have our cool season grasses. But some objectives that I'd like for us to go through here as we talk about this is we're gonna break those down. We're gonna talk about the legumes. We're gonna talk about the grasses. But also want us to talk about uh, fertilizer considerations. And then we're gonna get into talking about some of those pests of the warm and cool season grasses. And you all know what that pest is. And that's gonna be our fall army worm. So moving into the legumes. Uh, some advantages of some legumes. We're going to talk about advantages and disadvantages of both legumes and both the grasses, but some advantages of the legumes is the high nutritive value. And that can be because of, of a legume's capability of being able to fix nitrogen within itself. It's actually going to fix its own nitrogen on that root system of that plant. When used properly, it can be used is an alternative to nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, you'll see reports that'll say that approximately 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre is what you can potentially get if things go as planned whenever you put these in. Now we'll note, and you can find this on our on our Forage Facts website that we have through Extension that's managed by our uh, forage specialist, Vanessa Olson, Dr. Vanessa Olson, uh, excellent resource that we have out of Overton. But 20% of that nitrogen fixation, that nitrogen application, you could say, of those legumes, its ability to make nitrogen within that plant be in that soil, 20% of it is going to be from that plant. Now, to get the full utilization of it, you're going to be able, going to have to have livestock consume that plant and therefore uh, uh, use the restroom out there on your property. And then to, to really make this work, if you can spread that manure out across the property, that's how you get the other 80% of the application. So we want to make sure that as, as we say that it can be used as an alternative to nitrogen fertilizer, just because you go out there and plant clover or plant uh, veg and you get a, a, get a good stand of it, if you don't do anything with it, if you don't utilize it, you're, you're losing 80 80% of, of the game right there. So we want to make sure we utilize that property. Uh, palatability. Uh, it's a, it, animals love legumes. It, it's highly palatable. So that's some advantages of the legumes. Some disadvantages. Le legumes are more more soil specific. You'll see here in a, in a little bit that uh, uh, they're, they're more adaptable in a more neutral type soil. In a a soil that is, is slightly acidic to a soil that's, that's slightly alkaline. So we've got a range of about six to eight on that pH scale right there. They are annual, so annual planting is necessary. Uh, 
uh, most of them are annuals. You may hear of some perennials out there, but the ones that we talk about for the most part are going to be annuals. And then you do get into some blow potential. You've probably heard that if you do plant clover out there, you do run the risk. Or if you have clover come up volunteer, there is a slight risk of, uh, uh, of some blow potential there. Uh, some of the legumes are, are more blow potential than others. Um, so, so just knowing kind of which one that you're you're dealing with and and uh, the potential of it causing blow. So we we get into talking about some of the types of legumes. Well, we have air leaf clover, we have white clover, rose clover, crimson clover, ball clover, vetch, turnips, radishes, and Persian clover. Persian clover is one that uh, uh, you know we it, it, we don't hear about it a whole lot. However, a lot of us do have it. You may notice a clover that comes up voluntarily in the springtime in your pastures that has a little purple flower on the top of it. Uh, and, and that clover is actually Persian clover. And thanks to it, it, uh, it voluntarily provides us some, some spring grazing in a lot of our pastures here around the county, also known as subterranean clover as well. But that's that one uh, that, that has that little purple flower that comes up uh, in, in the springtime and, and provides great grazing for us here in the Fanning County area. So just to kind of go over some of the, the pHs that we may see with some of the soils, um, your air leaf clover is a 6 to 7 pH, ball is a 6.5 to 8.5 per seam is a 6.5 to 8.5, crimson clover is a 6 to a 7 on the pH, Persian is 6 to 8, red is 6.5 to 8, rose is 6 to 8, and then your subterranean clover is, is uh, going to be uh, ab about a 6 to an 8, depending on the, the situation. Now, some of these clovers, some of them do better in areas that drain well, and some of them can tolerate areas that don't drain as well. So we have a chart that, that helps explain that. If you have any questions on it, uh, feel free to, to give us a call. There's early maturing varieties and there's late maturing varieties. So what we sometimes suggest is that if you can mix some of these varieties together and seed companies can actually custom mix these for you. Say for instance, uh, uh, air leaf clover is a late maturing variety. Uh, crimson clover is an early maturing variety. And then uh, Persian clover is a medium maturing variety. Well, if we can mix those three together, we've got crimson clover that's going to come on early. Then we've got when it starts playing out a little bit, we've got Persian clover coming right behind it. And then when it starts playing out, we've got air leaf clover coming right behind it. So so when you kind of kind of mix some of those species together, intermix those species together, we can stagger that grazing out if that's your utilization of the clovers. We can stagger that out throughout the, the springtime. Some other clovers uh, so, or some other legumes to make you aware of is there's Austrian winter pea. Uh, it likes a pH of a 5.8 to a 7. Then we'll get into our vetch, and we can break those down into common vetch and hairy vetch, and they like a pH of a 5 to an 8. So, so we get into more of our northern parts of the county when we get into that acidic, more sandy type soil. Our vetch is going to be more adaptable in those areas. Um, and flowering dates on those, Austrian winter pea is going to be early May, and then uh, your vetch is going to be late April. They work well for grazing. They work well for hay situations. So the last thing I want to touch on here on the Texoma cattlemen is going to be seed inoculation. If you're uh, going to be planting clovers, uh, you want to have this seed inoculated. And it's inoculated with finely ground peat moss, and it's used as a, as a carrier for rhizobium bacteria. Um, you can purchase pre-inoculated seed, and this this an uh, inoculated uh, 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 seed inoculant. It's it's a black sooty uh, substance. It's kind of what, what it looks like. So if you stand down the seed, it's it's going to kind of cover it in some some basically like sticking your hand in ashes. It's kind of kind of what it looks like. It'll get your hand hand uh, a little powdery. So. Anyways, that's going to wrap it up for our Tex Home Academy show here on 95.7 FM, 1420 AM. The Warrior, sponsored by Fan and Ag Products. We appreciate their sponsorship, and we'll be coming with you here directly with our show, Ag 30, here on this Warrior.